this episode. We get silky and shaggy with our guest interview. We wish Parker a happy birthday. We discover the brains that might have been. And Space Precinct bows out in style. That's all coming up on Pod 57 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Where, where are we now? What pod is this? <laughs> now's not a great time to say, Richard, at the start of recording. It's pod 57 Play, right now. It's pod 57 of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Yeah. That's amazing. That's Here we it. are again. Uh, and you are? And, uh, I am Jamie Lionel Anderson. And you are? Uh, Richard Neinstein James. Brilliant. Yeah. One of those is a real middle name and the other isn't. So we'll leave it up to you <laughs> listeners to guess which is which. Anyway... Uh, it's it's the Jerry Anderson podcast. Yes. Welcome along if you're a new listener or an old listener. Yes. I yeah. mean a podster on, not an old listener. Yeah, yeah. What can uh, listeners new or old expect from this podcast, Richard? Well, I should say that they're in for much the same as they were in for in any other previous podcast they may have listened to, if they're old podsterons and listeners. Uh, that is to say, <laughs> uh, we've got, of course, Chris Dale's amazing randomizer a little later on, whereby he sits down in front of a random Jerry Anderson episode and gives us his thoughts and comments, except this week, of course... It's not even random, mm. is it? It's not random. And why is that, Richard? Well, because last week saw Chris watching the first part of the Space Precinct story, Death Watch. Absolutely. So the rules of the randomizer dictate that this week he'll be sitting down to watch Death Watch Part 2. That's okay. true. So yeah. what do we call it when it's not random and the randomizer? Um, don't really know. The fixinator, perhaps. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, what would we call that? The sequencer, no. Uh, uh, yeah, sequencer is fine. Anyway, yeah. so oh, yes. uh, it's a slightly different thing this week. Yeah. Uh, and what else beyond the not random randomizer? Uh, well, we've got some uh, newsy news, 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 of course, because there's always stuff happening in the Jerry Anderson universe. Uh, we've got an interview uh, this week, Jamie, that you will be conducting uh, shortly after we finish this podcast. I think is that right? Yes, I'm gonna. It's gonna happen after we record, but it's yeah. now gonna be inserted during the recording. Yes, uh, and that is with voice actor and a generally nice chap. Mark Silk, uh, and you may know him from Danger Mouse and Scooby Doo and yeah. uh, Go Jetters and loads of other things. Yes, uh, we'll be reading out some of your tweets uh, and also some messages from the <laughs> Facebook listeners group. That's uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons. Uh, and we'll also have some quick fire fives, of course. So, another packed program for all you Jerry Anderson fans. And we know that there are lots of you all over the world because we hear from you very regularly uh, via email on podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll be reading out some of your emails a little later on. <laughs> we will. We will. Yes. You, you know, I'm just laughing because you've said the quick fire five and I've forgotten to do mine, so I'm just very quickly <laughs> scribbling them down right now. Oh, let's hope that klaxon doesn't go off any time in the next three seconds. Uh, yeah. Oh, I hope it doesn't. <laughs> Well, you'll have to go first with your quick fire five for me, Richard. Come on then, Jamie. Are you ready? Let's do it now. Let's get it out of the way. Uh, not really. Early doors. Right, here we are. Pets. Four Feather Falls, Dusty the Dog, or Space Precinct's Zill the... whatever it was. Uh, Zill. Terror Hawks. TV series. Big Finish Audios. Oh, I think audios, actually. Oh. Movies. Doppelganger or Crossroads to Crime? <laughs> Doppelganger. <laughs> Crossroads to Crime, go in the bin. <laughs> First episodes. Captain Scarlet, the Mysterons, or new Captain Scarlet, Instrument of Destruction? Oh, mm. classic. Let's go for classic. All right. Uh, books. The Complete Book of Jerry Anderson's UFO by Chris Bentley or Space Precinct Unmasked by Richard James? Well, Richard, I mean, I couldn't choose anything other no, you're right. than Chris Bentley's Completely Book of UFO. Hey! Which are fantastic. Oh, there we are. That's the end of your quick bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Jamie. Very good. 
And obviously, you know, I, I love Space Precinct Unmasked. It's a, it, it's in fact, it's a bestseller at the Jerry Anderson store. Well, isn't it? I know, fun enough. I think it's it's sold out at the moment. I've got a, an order uh, on its way that I'll be signing over the weekend and sending to the Jerry Anderson store. Uh, so possibly by the time you hear this podcast, it will be winging its way uh, to the uh, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Nice plug. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, I, Richard may have already said it, but we're having a bit of a, a technical issue filled uh, FaceTime for this recording. Uh, did you say about subscribing? Oh, no, I haven't said that. No, should I do that now? Tell them to subscribe, yeah, Richard. Great. Okay. While you prepare the quick fire five for me. Um, so you can, of course, subscribe to us on uh, whichever platform you're listening to us on. That might be Spotify, iTunes or Apple Podcasts, as I think it is now. Could be on YouTube, could be on um, Stitcher, could be on Podbean or Podbay or Podcast, all these various places. Do subscribe. While you're there, uh, just leave us a nice review and a rating. Uh, and you can also share us with all your friends. So copy and paste the link into your Twitter feed or your Facebook page and say, hey, everyone, I'm listening to the hashtag Jerry Anderson podcast. And that's that way, hopefully, a few more people will get to hear us too. That would make us very happy indeed. <laughs> I'm just scribbling down my last quick fire five, Richard. <laughs> I've got nothing else to say, Jamie, unless you want me to do yeah. fab facts. No, no. Well, why don't you do the intro for fab facts? Because I know you're a fan now. And <sighs> I've just finished off my quick fire All five right. list. Now, time for this week's fab facts. Well, it's that time in the podcast, ladies and gentlemen, uh, whereby Jamie's going to flick through. Are you going to get your book, Jamie? Uh, the issue of, uh, of Fab Facts, which is full of um, uh, amazing uh, um, facts from the Jerry Anderson universe. Um, I'll shout out Fab and he'll stop at a particular page, pick a fact, and we shall discourse at length. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least three words will be said about yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Are you ready for a ready for a flicking yeah. before you fab me? Always ready for a flick. Okay, then here we go. Fab. Oh, uh, Richard. Yes. Ah, we have come to a halt on the spread of page sixty-four and sixty-five for those of you playing at home. And we know you will be. And let's go with the first fact on page sixty-four. That fact is this. Yes. In an attempt to get Thunderbirds back into production in 1983, Jerry Anderson created a new format. Ah. He had plans to shed Brains' bespectacled, stuttering 60s image. The Brains of the 1980s was going to become a clear-sighted, eloquent young man keen on home computers. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. So there you go. That is interesting. So there's... Um... This was something your dad came back to again and again and again, then, obviously, to reboot and refresh and <laughs> hopefully get off the ground again. I think it's one of the few series that he really felt was hard done by in terms of not being renewed for right. much longer. Yeah. As part of uh, Lou Grade's desire to uh, always have <clears throat> a, a fresh new series to play with and to sell. Yeah. And so there were multiple times when dad wanted to, to give it uh, a, a new lease of life. Um, through I think the late 70s, early 80s, um, again late 80s, again early 90s, yeah. again late 90s, 2000s. Right. You know, and he was always writing treatments and coming up with new you know character uh, ideas and all sorts of stuff. Yes. And in fact, I've got some great artwork which I think is from that 80s suggested revival um, with uh, Penelope and Parker and a couple of vehicles and stuff, which look pretty cool. Ah. They do look quite eighties now, though. Yes, sure. Um, and they were—I I mean, eventually all of this early eighties work led to the creation of Terrorhawks, ah. Thunderbirds, Thunderhawks, yeah. Terrorhawks. Yeah. Was the kind of Genesis-ish. Yeah. But uh, yeah, do you think that would have made brains less well kind of lovable? That's really interesting, isn't it? Because in today's age of inclusivity, of course, the one thing we do want in children's series like that is perhaps characters with glasses and characters with a stutter and yeah. characters with i don't know disabilities and all sorts because that's the age yeah. we live in now yeah well we want to see a fair representation yeah. across uh, real life yeah. so yeah maybe that wouldn't work now yeah fun isn't it um yeah and i always it... thought they should have had a tracy sister uh, yes uh, tracy <laughs> Tracy Tracy, of course. Yeah, of course, had to yeah, be. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, well, undoubtedly there would be, of course, wouldn't there, nowadays? Yeah. But that's interesting. You know what, you... He's sort of ironing out the kinks of the character there. That's, uh, I think that's quite a shame if Brains had just been, you know, some nerdy kid. Yeah. 
maybe that was just a bit um, in vogue at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you just reminded me, actually, this mm. is not a really a fab fact at all, but um, I went to a, a charity thing for Alzheimer's Society a couple of years ago and met a lady there who was a press officer for... Um, uh, for a major broadcaster, mm-hmm. and uh, she introduced herself as Tracy, uh, and somebody told her, you know, the connection. Yes, and she said, "You're never going to believe this, but my surname is Island." <laughs> now, <Come on. laughs> I'd had a couple of beers, and I completely believed her for a good <laughs> half hour before she finally you oh, know, fessed that's up. Brilliant, that's great. But uh, if you're listening to this and yeah. you do know a real Tracy. Island, yes. Then uh, do let us know. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's widen that out. Actually, if you know anyone who shares a name with any character from the Jerry Anderson universe, let us know. Yeah, that would be marvelous. Yes. Uh, now, Richard, before we ramble on any further, should we bring this week's fab facts to a close? Let's do that, Jamie, in our old time-honored fashion. Okay. Well, that's the end of this week's brains, brains fact. fact. Beautiful. <laughs> Wasn't it? If you don't mind me saying, Jamie, I think you're always just a little bit slow on that. Rhythm wise. Oh, do you think it needs to be brains back? Yes, I do. That's exactly what I think it should be. Because that's how I Would do it. Would you want to do it again then? Well, no, let's leave it till next week. Okay, See next week I'll then. get it right. <laughs> Although I could, of course, just compress the. Oh, so anyway. Curses. Yeah. And what a lovely fab fact that was. Richard. I think, do you know, that we should do some sort of compilation of. Anderson th- reboots that almost were. Oh, right, you know, okay. Perhaps I could send over a load of stuff to the randomizer general commander in chief yeah. uh, himself, yes. Chris Dale, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe Chris could write a lovely article about yeah. uh, all the things that might have been and the way they would have, That's uh, right. would have gone. Yeah. Anyway, how interesting. What have you got there, Richard? What have I got here? Um, what? Just a bit of paper and stuff? What, what did you have in mind? <laughs> um, not very much. <laughs> well, you might have some comments from the podster on oh, sorry. or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could do that. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going out slightly out of order, but yeah, that's fine. That's right. That's great. No, so uh, you may well know that uh, our listeners have their own Facebook page. <laughs> if you didn't know, you do now. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons, uh, where they've been playing guess the episode from pictures that have been posted. Uh, they've had funny caption competitions, and also this is quite sweet. Emma Nichols has got a birthday coming up. She's asking for donations to the Young People's Puppet Theatre for her birthday via the Facebook group. So if you're a member. Uh, do consider chucking, you know, just a pound or two would be great because, uh, as, as well as Jamie knows, it, with your association with them, they're an amazing charity that do brilliant work with, with young people. They do indeed. Fantastic work. Go and, go and check out their website, ypbt.org.uk, and read more about what they do. Yeah, uh, many people on the Facebook page wished uh, David Graham a happy 94th birthday this week. 94, yeah. isn't he amazing? Yes, that's right. Uh, so the likes of Andrew Clements and Rebecca Andrews, Ross Patterson, Charles Stewart and Heather Ballard all said a happy birthday to David. James Howe in particular said, Today, one of my favourite actors turns 94. I want to say not just happy birthday to David Graham, but thank you for being part of one of my favourite TV shows. Isn't that lovely? Um, Stephen Carson posted on the uh, Facebook group. Uh, he's been thinking about some merchy, merch, merch, merch ideas. He says there are a few here, so feel free to select the ones that you like. Firstly, how about a Demeter City 2040 badge? Secondly, what about a model of Fireball Junior? Thirdly, perhaps replica Thunderbird hats? Fourthly, perhaps a model of the Moon Mobile from Captain Scarlet? Yes, right. I said Mobile. Is that right? Probably. Moon Mobile? <laughs> moon Mobile? Who knows? Uh, uh, fifthly, I was wondering if Gemini Force 1 could be made more accessible by turning each of the books into graphic novels. I like the Space Precinct Reloaded comic book, uh, and I think it could really work here. Lastly, I think some fans would like a bracelet that had charms in the shape of the Thunderbirds and pod vehicles, and then fans could perhaps buy additional charms. I have more ideas, but I'll let your, let your other listeners have some input, says Stephen. From Edinburgh. <laughs> well, that would be nice, Stephen, yeah. Let us get a word in somewhere. Goodness me, that was a long list, but a good list though. Yeah. Great, some great ideas there. <clears throat> That's and right. Some stuff that maybe that could happen. We, yeah, yeah. We're, we're working on it. I mean, we're always putting out new stuff for you guys, which you seem to love collecting. Which yes. we, you know, we love the fact that you love it. That's right. But uh, of course, the thing is, it's got to sell, isn't it? At the end of the day, because um, you know, otherwise that money's going to come out of my fee, and I can't have that. Absolutely, Richard. <laughs> I mean, can't what are you do then. Uh, Robert Taylor finally said, "I wonder which stars of stage and screen Richard James has met this week in the chemist in Cookham." <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is Wendy Craig. 
No Timmy Mallet this week? I haven't seen Timmy, and I think he's off on his travels this week, actually. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Good for Timmy. And I'm not sure Wendy Craig's a Thunderbirds fan or a Jerry Anderson fan. Otherwise, no. you know, I would have nabbed her. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm. Well, I mean, after news like that... Yes. The Jerry Anderson news is going to seem rather flat, <laughs> but should we have it anyway? Let's have some newsy news news news. There now follows a Jerry Anson news announcement from the Jerry Anson podcast. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I did that. Sorry. Oh, uh, the changes. Too much coffee this morning. Yes. Uh, now, Richard. Uh, yes. Probably uh, as uh, people who possess one of each here, uh, this would be interesting to see what you think. Right. When it comes to the puppet shows, do you prefer big heads or small heads? Oh, I think I prefer the smaller heads. Interesting. I'm more of a big head man myself. Well, I have heard. <laughs> no, for Very me, actually, actually, I do have a large head, you know. Really, yeah, yes, okay. the, yeah, yeah, comparatively, don't fit me. Mm. Hats don't fit me. Yeah, sorry, yeah. do carry on. Well, it's just, yes, it's just the, the realism thing for me. They just, you know, if anything looks like a puppet, I can't see past the fact that it's a puppet. If it looks more human, it just helps me in my limited but then imagination. Why, why, why have it being a puppet at all? Well, know? I don't know. Then, don't just have a human. Them. Don't ask me. No, I, I know. Well. But this is the very thing that Chris Dale uh, is discussing, ah. debating in an article on the Jerry Anderson website, which you can read right now, mm-hmm. jerryanderson.co.uk, mm-hmm. uh, a question of proportions. Oh. So we'd love it if you had your say. And perhaps we could run a little poll on the uh, Podster on's Facebook group Richard, okay. to yep. see what the overall consensus is. Okay. Uh, and obviously the, the losing head size uh, will lead to the deletion uh, of all film uh, yeah. of any of those shows featuring that head size. Yeah, quite uh, right. <clears throat> asterisk, that may not happen. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, we'd love to know what you think there. Uh, we've also got a Captain Scarlet promo talking of small heads uh, running on the lovely 50th anniversary pin badges, which are very, very smart indeed. Mm. Uh, and the <clears throat> challenge coins, the anniversary challenge coins, which are really nice collectibles. So there's 20% off of those while stocks last. It's kind of end of line deal um, and that will run for the rest of the month. So go and grab those. Yes. And for those of you who are comic artist fans. Oh, yeah. Comic art fans. Mm. You may well know the name Andrew Skilleter. Yes. Yes, I do. Why do you know the name Andrew Skilleter, Richard? I know him from his Doctor Who associations. He did a fantastic... I remember, you see, because I'm so old, I remember the 20th anniversary Radio Times uh, special edition, and he yep. did a fantastic cover art for that, which is lovely. Well, you are spot on. Uh, for those of you who don't know Andrew, he's best known for his professional Doctor Who art. He contributed extensively to the 1990s Jerry Anson comics. Mm-hmm. For Thunderbird, Stingray, Captain Scarlet and Joe 90, and worked with the legendary Alan Fennell, who was editor on those. Um, he also illustrated the complete Thunderbird story written by Alan Fennell. Um, Andrew's done more Captain Scarlet and Thunderbird stuff in the early 2000s for Eagle Moss. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, you, you'll know his images, you'll yes, recognise them. definitely. Uh, and we've done a deal with him and ITV to bring <clears> you <throat> lovely signed exclusive art prints of those uh, great designs ah. at the Jerry Anderson store. So we'll be starting with the first three... Captain Scarlet and Cloudbase. Yeah. Scarlet Fire and Thunderbirds are go! Great. As it's written in capital letters. Yes. Here, which are great images that uh, Andrew's done. They will be available from this coming Saturday Ooh. on the Jerry Anderson store. Shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Lovely. And I think, <clears throat> for now and at least, unless you've got anything else. Well, we said goodbye this week to uh, a member of the Jerry Anderson alumni. I don't know if you know that, but Freddie Jones, who wasn't really associated with the Jerry Anderson stuff, particularly uh, a, a ubiquitous actor who did lots and lots of work over his probably 70 year career. Um, I think appeared in um, an episode of Space 1999 or two. Uh, yes. And Protectors as well, I think. Yeah. I believe he did. Uh, so that'll be a name known to, to Jerry Anson fans. And also, I poured cold porridge on his chest in a, a TV series of, of Casanova with David Tennant. I played a, a quack doctor who was trying to uh, revive Freddie Jones on his deathbed. Right. Oh, and also, I worked with his son, Rupert Jones, who directed some episodes of um, um, Sir Gadabout. Yeah, there you go. Small world. Isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, well, that's a bit of sad news to end, yeah. end uh, the news section on, but thank you for putting yeah. that in, Richard. Um, so I suppose, unless there is anything else, your, your face doesn't say there is anymore? No, my face is being very quiet at the moment. No. OK, fine. Well, then that is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. No, not going to sing it. You're not singing this no, week? No, not this week. Why is that? Well, because everyone at home will be singing it, won't they? 
Oh, I see. I bet you they've all sung it. There. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Without you. Exactly. Oh, yeah, it's all right. Sad. That's fine. Uh, so, gosh, you I feel a bit. Uh, that's a break from tradition. Tradition, and I feel a bit <laughs> well, sad about you know, that. Sometimes it's healthy, and you know, it's to leave things behind and move on to new pastures. That was the news. That was the news. <laughs> You're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Oh, uh, Richard. Oh, <laughs> please Richard. do uh, subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Uh, don't forget to rate, review, and share us with your friends so that they can hear us too. Uh, and you can also get in touch with us, as many people have been over the past few days, at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. This is the voice of the Podsterons. For example, Stephen Watson has got in touch to say, hi, you two lovely presenters. Oh, we're in the three emails already, aren't we? Sorry. <laughs> I so you're really, segued into it there, Jamie. You're really throwing me off this week. <laughs> he said, I have to say that the new 54321 intro is brilliant and pushing the podcasting boundaries into new areas. It's a keeper. Uh, the other thing I thought, listening to the Mike Trim recollections the other week, is that I finally realised what a wonderful thing you've done with the podcast. He's finally realised, Jamie. He's only taken 57 podcasts. <laughs> As a kid, he says, watching Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, even Joe 90 in the 60s, names like Reg Hill, Brian Burgess, Derek Meddings, Mary Turner, along with many others, were only names at the end of the show credits. Thanks to your interviews and general knowledge and personal experiences, they've now become real people who made these amazing shows come alive with love and skill and passion. That's quite an achievement. Uh, if you're able to find archive interviews or even record new ones with some of the other names, continuity, camera, costume, sound and the like, it would be a treat to hear i'm sure uh, thank you both and that's stephen watson who calls himself the impodsteron because he's uh, i don't think he's on facebook so he's not a member of the facebook group <laughs> but uh, that's nice though isn't it that's exactly it really what we're here for is to you know to celebrate yeah. these unsung heroes names that you might have seen at the end of shows let's hear their stories it's wonderful and there's loads more to come yeah we've got more archive interviews we'll be doing more um uh, more live interviews as well, mm -hmm. uh, but it's yeah, it's about kind of it's about bringing bringing voices to you uh, from behind the cameras, in front of the cameras, and at home. Yeah, that's the nice thing. Yeah. So we've got you know celebrity fans yeah. uh, like today with Mark Silk, but obviously Mark's got sort of industry connections as well, so yeah. he's got a unique point of view. And then yeah, absolutely things like Mike Trim. Um, we've got an archive interview with Mary Turner coming up in the next few weeks. Lovely. Um, yeah. So you, you'll get a view on the puppetry there. Uh, and I'm doing my best to dig out some of the archive interviews um, with people who are no longer with us. So lots to come. Great. Um, and you're, you're going to hear from some of those people who made your childhood dreams come true. Yeah, sweet. It's lovely. <laughs> uh, I have uh, our second and final oh, yes. email from today, uh, which is from Hugh Morn. How, how are you saying that? Morn. Okay, great. He gave us a, a, a nice little pronunciation guide, so yes. don't worry, I'm not going to say Mowen or morf, <laughs> Morphin. Um, so Hugh says, yes. hello, gentlemen. Hello. Um, I've been listening to this podcast since joining on Pod 51. That's all right. That's uh, quite recent. Yeah, it is, but welcome along. And it has become a fun and pleasant ride. Ah, good. Yeah, good, I'm glad to hear it. Uh Benji Clifford's interview on Pop 55 was really insightful and fascinating regarding the music scores of Anderson Productions, and Chris's lovely randomizer commentary of Lavender Castle took me back to when I watched the show during my CITV viewing years as a child during the 90s and early 2000s. Oh, That's great, isn't it? Yeah. yeah another generation. That's right, Thank lovely. Um, I also want to give Chris a thank you shout out for his Captain Scarlet mashup videos that he made. They still make me laugh for the outlandish yet brilliantly crafted storylines and sentence mixing. Uh, I look forward to the next pod, and I hope everybody's week is going F-A-B. Yeah. Best wishes, Hugh. Thanks, Hugh. That's nice. Yeah. Chris Dale does sterling work, doesn't he? I tweeted this week. I shared the... Um, he did a video of Captain Scarlet uh, uh, set to the uh, Bond theme, um, A View to a Kill, which is uh, rather nicely yeah, that, done. That, but that video is like four years old, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. It just I comes around these again, doesn't it? Ages ago, and they, yeah, they just pop up. Yeah. But yes, if you haven't seen Chris's stuff, uh, search out his channel, uh, Chris Dalek, on uh, on yeah. YouTube, or just search for uh, Colonel White's Movie Night or Colonel White Goes Crazy, yeah. uh, and you'll find uh, all of the hilarious stuff that he's yeah. done there. Brilliant That's great. Too. Yeah, very nice. So no more um, Podstron emails for this week, Richard. Uh, but it is time for your quick fire five. Oh, no, Carefully crafted over a, a very long period of time, yeah, and, and now illegible because oh, I scribbled oh, it. At the last moment, Captain Scarlet, 
magenta or brown? Oh, magenta. Good choice. Uh, Stingray, Mm. Atlanta or marina? Oh, marina. Orin's partners, Beazle or Romek? Oh, it's got to be Romek. Oh, of course it is. Otherwise he'll kill me. Space 1999, Bergman or Meyer? Oh, Bergman every time. Oh, interesting. Fair enough. And finally, Shane Rimmer, lesser known roles. Yes. Dick Spanner or the Space Police Pilots Brogan? Oh, Oh, I'm going to say Dick Spanner. I'm going to say Dick Spanner. Yeah. Okay. Although he, he is great as the older Brogan. That's a really nice uh, avenue that yeah. they sort of, they didn't go down for the series, but it does yeah. work that he's, uh, you know, somewhat older and gruffer than, than Ted yeah. Shackleford ever was. Yeah, nice. Also, the Bergman and Meyer stuff, you see, I don't, I I think we've spoken about this before, I do have memories of watching Space 1999 as a child mm. uh, on the first runs, I suppose, but uh, I remember Meyer from those initial runs, but don't remember Victor Bergman. It's only watching it in sort of later life that I've noticed him come to appreciate yeah. Barry Morse's fantastic performance as Bergman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. very nice. It was brilliant. Yeah. It, it's funny that, isn't it? Because there are a lot of people who, their <clears throat> their overriding memory of Space 1999 is being slightly in love with Maya. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But but for me, Bergman, it because he had that Doctor Who-like quality, Yes, I just... You know, and it's also the whole captivated. Yeah, right? it's the whole season one, season two thing as well, isn't it? You it know, is. that's there's a very definite dividing line there, isn't there? Unfortunately, it's probably best that we don't get into that. No, thing. let's not get into that. <laughs> um, is it time to head for some uh, some tweets? People have been getting touch. I think. Uh, yeah, we would love to hear your t- tweet tweeter birds countdown. <laughs> okay, nicely done. Here we go. Five. At number five, it's Robert Monk who says, Merchy Merch, still waiting for a diecast police cruiser from Space Precinct. Also, how's about a release of the Product Enterprise models? Hmm. Four. Fourthly, Tone says, finish the latest Jerry Anderson podcast. Another fine piece of archive rummaging for the interview. Also, a solid randomizer. But did I imagine it? Or did a clip from or a reference to Team America World Police get slipped in there? Chris Dale. Naughty Chris. Phil Davenport says, I hope you're enjoying the Apollo 50th coverage on TV at the moment. Throwback to a magical time for Anderson and space fans alike. Yes, indeed, Phil, absolutely. Peter Dernan says, I remember those days. This is in response to a tweet from you, Jamie, talking about a 4.15 start. Uh, But Peter Mm. says, now on Mondays, I just rushed to check if the Jerry Anderson podcast has dropped yet. One. And finally, Michael Okuda, the scenic artist supervisor on Star Trek, tweeted, I still have a soft spot in my heart for Space 1999. Such a beautifully designed, if flawed, production. Coming this month on Blu-ray. It is by a shout factory. Isn't that nice? Dear Mike, because Mike uh, designed the L-Cars operating system and all the screens and stuff next generation, didn't he? So a bit of a... Bit of an icon there. It really is. I will do my best to see if Mike would like to come on the uh, on the podcast. Yeah, I'm sure he would. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. So That'd thank you for uh, yeah for all your tweets during the week. Uh, you can simply hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast, or you can uh, tag I'm Jamie Anderson or me Richard N James, and we'll see your tweets there and uh, read them out next week. Well, we'll read out five of them next week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, not all of them. No, no. Uh, and now, Richard, uh, somebody who tweets quite a lot about Thunderbird stuff yeah. and other Jerry Anderson things is our interview guest. Oh yeah. Mark Silk. Great. Mark is a, an actor, voice actor, started on radio, um, does all sorts of talks and performance workshops and mm-hmm. goodies like that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I was in an event a couple of weeks ago where he was trying to teach the audience to do their very best Scooby Doo impression. Ruby, um, Ruby, <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, well, Mark's going to be out of a job. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, you see, I've got it all. <laughs> Well, we'll have to do a, a Richard James and Mark Silk uh, Scooby off <laughs> at some point. See how we go. Uh, anyway, I had a nice chat with Mark uh, all about uh, his love of Thunderbirds, what he thought of the voices uh, in the original, mm. um, why they were so good, and uh, I guess the impact it had on his career. Yeah. So without further ado, shall we chat to Mark? Without further a Scooby Doo, let's chat to Mark. Oh, Richard. I'm Mark Silk, I'm a voice actor, and I grew up as a massive fan of Jerry Anderson shows. Um, day to day, I work on things like Star Wars, there's a great show called Go Jettas for CBBS. there's a show called Thunderbird Psycho, there's Danger Mouse, there's Strange Hill High, Johnny Bravo, Johnny Bravo, Scooby-Doo, where are you? scooby doo be doo <laughs> and a whole stack of others, man, it's a hoot. <laughs> wow, that is, I think, the most variety 
intro anybody's ever given themselves on the podcast. So well, thank you. nice work, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we've, in fact, I, I have basically heard your uh, life story at um, an event a couple of weeks ago um, where you spoke at oh, CMC. You were, you, were in the, you were there. I was there and I heard you singing a song as a zebra. I, I'm, uh, I'm so proud. During the session, but let's leave that hanging, and our, our listeners will never know what happened in that bizarre. Just, uh, just hour. for hello, nice podcast listener. Just to interject, Jamie's referring to CMC, which is Children's Media Conference, where I spoke about what I do for a living in front of lots of people who run television stations. Yes, exactly that, uh, and it was very entertaining. So well done, Mark. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I've I've heard you do all, all manner of voices, and I'm sure some of them will leak out into this chat. I'm a leaker. That uh, he's already at it, but you are. A Jerry Anderson fan. Uh, you yeah, I really am. In your, in your chat at CMC uh, that David Graham had quite an impact on you. Uh, but we will get there in due course. Sure. But for now, um, jump with me into a Jerry Anderson style TARDIS, pop back to your childhood. And can, you, can we find somewhere, either the very first time you saw a Jerry Anderson show, or at least kind of the earliest memories, if they're a bit more am amorphous in terms of the chronology? I think one of the very first times I ever saw a Jerry Anderson show, it was Thunderbirds, and um, my, we, were t we were waving my nan off at the airport, at Birmingham Airport, right? And, right. It, right, and in, the, in the lobby there, they had these pay TVs. You could sit in a chair, and in front of you was a television. And it was Saturday morning. And they were all watching Thunderbirds on these pay TVs. There were about so three or four of them in the lobby lab by the vending <laughs> machines. And there were these pay TVs. And it was like, that is incredible. I gotta watch this. And, and um, I was little. I was only, oh, I don't know how old I was. 26. And, and, um, uh, and from that moment, you, know, you, you saw this thing that looked completely cinematic, larger than life. It was everything. And went back and, and the following Saturday, uh, I I was a devoted Thunderbirds fan, and I think the first I think the first ever episode I saw, which is probably still my favourite Thunderbirds episode, was Terror in New York City. Nice this choice. It is it is it's got everything in it. That's a stonker to be starting with. Yeah, it's got everything. My favourite city in real life is New York, but the fact that you know, as an as an ambition, we're going to move the Empire State Building, but it wasn't like we're going to move it to Chicago. We're going to move it about you know eight feet. <laughs> it was that. <laughs> That's what was so lovely about it. We're just going to move it a little bit, a bit to yeah. the left, and yeah. you know, and you know and. and I loved right from um, ever since I was a little kid. I always loved the, the behind the scenes moments on TV shows and movies. And so the fact you've got Ned Cook, uh, you know, as this amazing reporter you know, taking you through what's going to happen and the whole disaster unfolds. Yeah, you know, there's on his outside broadcast truck, and it's a guy holding a microphone, and there's international rescue coming through. It was, I, I think, you know, that that and the very first episode of Thunderbirds. But I, I think um, are my are my favourites. But I think. I think Terror in New York City is such a uh, a, a great uh, example of everything that's terrific about Thunderbirds. But that that was my first experience. That was my introduction, and that it all it all grew from there. Great, that, that is a great first memory. And the, weirdly, the like pay TVs in an airport isn't lobby, that weird. I mean, it actually feels like a, a weirdly over the top kind of. Thunderbirdsy invention that you might see, yeah, uh, in London Airport in uh, in 2065, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> it, it was, and I just remember waving my nan off, and I was there to wave my nan off, and really, I kind of want, yeah, okay, bye, and I just wanted to go back and watch Thunderbirds. Yeah, nice. So that that hooked you. What what for context? What contemporaneously was happening uh, on on TV for kids when when you first saw Thunderbirds? What, oh, well. what was what competing against? Do you think? What else were you watching? I, I I think at that point it was it was still. It was still things like Cosgrove Hall shows like Danger Mouse and Duckler and Chilton and the Wheelies nice. and Repeats of Bagpuss and Mr. Ben and, and other things that were massive influences to me, like, um, you know, the Warner Brothers cartoons of Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and You Are Despicable and all this stuff. And then, and Muppets and there's all, there were all those, yeah. it was that kind of moment in TV in Britain. It's a great where, era. Oh, it was, it was the best to have Muppets and all those iconic shows now really the kind of shows that you'd walk around uh, wearing the T-shirt of them, it, w it was that. Yep. And, and then a few years after that, um, it led into, now I'm, I'm, 
Now, the Channel 5 VHS release of Thunderbirds were after, uh, yes. were, were after Terror Hawks was released because that was about 85, yeah. the Channel 5 stuff. So, yeah. by the way, just as, just as a fanboy, just flipping from one thing to another, when they released those Channel 5 videos of, of Thunderbirds, I was yeah. so excited when you saw the intro by Parker. <laughs> in his pink shirt. Was yes, it was in a pink Hawaiian yeah. shirt. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the quality of the film was so ropey. But it was oh, great. Yeah. But, it was but it was so cool because this was a piece of Thunderbirds action. Well, a conversation with Parker, direct yeah. to me in the audience, that the only place you could see that was on that video. Yeah. You know, if you're a true Thunderbirds fan, you couldn't see this on TV or anywhere else. You had to get that video. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's not like now where you dial into YouTube and, you know, it's all there. That was such an exciting moment. But not long after um, the, the experience at the airport and, and the kind of shows that I was watching then, and it would have been repeats of Thunderbirds and, uh, and Stingray. That was it. Yep. I remember, oh, my God. I remember a friend of my nan's again would pick me up from school. <laughs> this is weird. I haven't thought of this for years. A it's of my, lovely when memories like this. I out. love this. A friend of my nan's would pick me up from school and we'd go back and um, around that time they were showing Thunderbirds on ITV. No, they are showing Stingray on ITV. That was it. And mm -hmm. so I, I ended up having this VHS that had all the, every episode of Stingray, like back to back on Wonko Vision or VHS, you know. But that was, um, <laughs> and that was, but the, and then that, that then led in to the real big deal, which was Terror Hawks coming out. You know, because we hadn't seen a Jerry Anderson puppet show for a long, long time. Yeah. And then when Terror Hawks was out, that kind of, uh, that, that was a whole new deal. And I remember the, uh, just the, the, the sense of excitement of seeing that. And do you remember, there was a Saturday morning show called The Saturday Show on mm -hmm. ITV, and it replaced Tiz Was. Do you remember that show? Uh, I'm, I'm slightly too young, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry. They go, no, yeah. no, I don't. I have <laughs> a life. Our listeners might. I, I don't. I have a life. <laughs> Is that, yeah. Well, <laughs> basically, Tiz Was was a big Saturday morning kid show, and it was total anarchy. They couldn't make that show now because it was dangerous as hell. Anyway. The replacement show was a show called The Saturday Show, and it was on in the morning, every Saturday morning, um, hosted by Tommy Boyd. And they had this, they, they, they had a, a few weeks where it was puppet show um, guests. Yep. And the, the, I managed to get tickets to be in the audience for this one show. <laughs> now, here's the best bit. The guests were Jim Henson, Jerry Anderson, another week, and Roland Rat. Another week. Guess which one I ended up at? <laughs> yeah, I, was, I ended up in Rolling Rats. I think, <laughs> I'm a massive Henson fan, massive Anderson fan, and I sit there watching Rolling Rat. There is nothing wrong with Rolling Rat. You are correct, of course. <laughs> it was quite funny. But, um, but they had, um, they had a, a, a Saturday show, uh, Terror Hawks special. I remember, um, yeah. I remember them having some of the puppets on there. Yeah. I was so excited, that and, right. and that was—that's half an hour drive from where I lived. Ah, gosh, all all, all kind of small in, worldy, in grand related stuff, Birmingham centric. Yeah, here's another Amazing. Birmingham Thunderbirds, Jerry Anderson related bit of trivia that you—I mean, of course you all know this, but I, I guess a lot of people wouldn't that the sound design for Thunderbirds was done in Birmingham. And that was a revelation to me by John Taylor. Uh, yeah, there was, John, there was, and Gene. John and Gene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. And they worked on a whole bunch of Anderson shows. But, um, and, they, and this is bizarre. When I first started doing what I do for, you know, voice performance and stuff, I, I built my first basic studio. And the guy that sold my first kit to me is a brilliant musician. He, he's a very successful guy that does, works with a lot of bands now called Richard Taylor. <laughs> And, and he said, you've got to come over sometime. I said, so I did. And we went over. It turned out he lived above a recording studio in Birmingham called the Hollick and Taylor Studio. And his mom was Gene Taylor, still is, and his yeah. dad still is, is John Taylor. And as a, I'm a massive Th Thunderbirds fan. And you think, hang on a second. What's your dad do? 
And then you realise he's the guy that's done all this as well as <laughs> as well as they had the studio downstairs that that you know recorded lots of bands and things. But it, I had no idea growing up that that the sound design for Thunderbirds and I think Stingray, Fireball yeah. as well, there was stuff done uh, in Birmingham there. Yeah. And um, and to my friend Richard, Jerry Anderson was Uncle Jerry, and he <laughs> and he told me that Jerry would bring over um, prototype early versions of toys that were about to be released or they were considering to release, you know, like... The, oh, nice. Like, Kids dream there. Yeah. Now, can you imagine as a collector or a lover of this what they'd be worth now? Oh, yeah. You know, these... So, right. And he just played with them and bashed them up like a kid would with toys because they were just toys, right? But that... And, and uh, I remember Gene telling me about um, when Jerry would, would uh, drive up and, and record the voice of Robbie the Robot... And, yeah. he, and he said, she said that there were moments where they would just break out laughing and have to stop recording because there was Jerry either with something like a bin on his head and a microphone basically going, welcome home on our way home. Yeah, with a, with a, with a as he described, a vibrator to his throat. <laughs> yeah, I uh, think I'm not was, sure that's the technical term. But. I think it was probably a vocoder, but that, that's the same yeah. kind of thing, yeah. But so funny. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a lovely piece of Thunderbirds Anderson history to know that that was done, you know, in my home city. And the studio's still there. It's, 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 it's past its glory days. They, yeah. they sold it many, many years ago. But, but yeah. I think, I think before it was sold, we came up and did a sort of family visit. I mean, I'm talking like 20 something years ago. Wow, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was probably just down the road at some point. Yeah. Two decades ago. <laughs> yeah. In, in fact, it was a treat for me. I, I, I loved the fact that this happened. The very first cartoon show I ever worked on um, was at Cosgrove Hall, uh, who made Danger Mouse and Duckula and all those shows. And I remember being in the canteen of Cosgrove Hall, and there was a guy in front of me that was taking ages to, to decide what topping he wanted on his jacket potato. And he went to, and, and as he got to the till, it was, it was Jerry Anderson. I'm a massive Jerry Anderson fan. Forget work for a second. I, I, you know, I love this, and uh, and it was great. And it, he was working at Cosgrove Hall uh, on Lavender Castle. Yeah, and so I ended up having lunch with him and the, the producer Chris Bowden, who and now Chris works for McKinnon and Saunders, who make all the stop motion puppets for well, yes, indeed. Uh, you know, Tim Burton and Wes Anderson and other people you may know, you, um, <laughs> that and it was and it was great. And so this guy John Taylor the sound designer he was my conversational in with jerry I, I said lovely to meet you i hope your potato is nice john taylor <laughs> says hello and he went and the first thing he said was oh has he sold that bloody house yet <laughs> that sounds like a very dad response yeah but it, it was such a treat just just spending time with him really yeah you know fantastic and did you get any insights from that meeting mark did you you know pick up any nuggets or not a sausage think? Oh, oh shame! Well, I, Wait, what, well, was it a never meet your heroes moment? No, it, it actually it really was a meet your heroes moment because I discovered that it's okay to have beans and cheese on a potato. I, I see. I, now, uh, just you know, little insight here. <laughs> I've taken it one step further with the next generation: beans, cheese, and tuna. You see, your family. There's a tip for you. You've got a family of visionaries, Jamie. <laughs> Uh, without that kind of thinking, without that forward thinking, without that absolutely. vision, these shows would never be made. That's why exactly. you and your family are who you are. That is the, that's the kind of thinking that gets these things done and, and gets millions of people enthralled. Uh, also, uh, Thai chicken crisps crumbled up on top of that. that. That's like next level stuff. Anyway, Mark, this is not what we're here to be talking about. <laughs> But amazing kind of load of uh, uh, connections and, um, you know, things that happened completely by accident or, you know, bumping into them behind a jacket potato. Have you got more jacket potato stories? No, uh, probably more Anderson-related things that might be useful. Oh, did you, okay. Now, not that you probably needed to because you lived in this world, but did you ever get to see any of the, the Anderson exhibitions that they had? Because as, uh, as again, yeah, the mm. one in Blackpool, Win the, win the Winter Gardens in the in the nineties is what I'm thinking. Oh right, well there was I saw one in the I think it was probably the early nineties in the Winter Gardens, and that was yeah. a really good yeah. one. But they had one at Alton Towers. Yes, yeah, so I never went to that, but I know of it, and I loved that. So well, tell me about the Alton Towers well, one because again, I, as, I, I've heard of it, but I don't know what was there. What was it like? Well, as a, it's, uh, I remember it being very exciting and, and themed pretty well and, and the music playing and a couple of clips playing, but um, it might be rose-tinted glasses, but I remember it at the time as, as my favourite bit of going to Alton Towers because it was, 
I don't know whether they'd have been original puppets. Some of them might have been. Who knows? Yeah, there were certainly some. Yeah, but it was great. They had. I. I the, there was definitely some stuff from Thunderbirds. I. I, do, I think um, Captain Scarlet. I think there was a Space Nineteen Ninety Nine costumes there. But um, my my memory was was of just just pure joy, just being in this environment around those those models and puppets and seeing some of the ships and things. And there was another one that was just weird, and it was a one off. They had um, a just a, a small display one afternoon in Birmingham at the Palisade Shopping Centre of Jerry Anderson <laughs> Puppets, and Christine right. and Christine Glanville was there. Ah, uh, lovely Christine, she was brilliant. And there was her and one other person. There's a guy with her. Uh, I forget who would it, who it would have been. But would it, it have been just, Richard, Richard Gregory, possibly. Possibly, I, I won't pretend to know. But it yeah, was it could just, well have been. But I, my, my dad took me there just just to see them and say hello, and it was just so weird. In the middle of the shopping centre, there was no sort of um, real sense of event. It was just these people just there, on this little table, and <laughs> and these puppets. And you think, well, you're kind of TV royalty. You know, this was immense talent that yeah. that no one really knew that, that was in front of them. But to me, it meant the world. Now, that's exciting to me to see that stuff, to meet, to meet people who are at their absolute heart or, uh, of that kind of creativity, making those moments that, are, that just stand the test of time that become these iconic bits of telly. And she's one yeah. of them. And she was just standing yeah. there by Thornton's. <laughs> did she have a, a Scott Tracy puppet with her? By any chance? I remember? think she did. Yeah. Yeah, I think she did. Yeah, she she had one that was kind of c- constructed of rescued parts from the original series. Oh, golly, uh, Scott, so Scott, was... Scott, Scott's rescued parts. That sounds like another episode. <laughs> it was one that was sadly uh, canned before it made it to the screen. Uh, did so, you did you ever just interrupted? Did you ever get to um, ever been to a place in Birmingham? Uh, it's just changed its name now to Worlds Apart, but called Nostalgia and Comics. No, really famous. Uh, comic shop and you know movie memorabilia shop in Birmingham. Yeah. It's been there ever since I was a kid, and that again was another place where I learned so much about behind the scenes of Anderson shows. And you know, you find out about you find out about the puppeteers, and you find out about uh, Derek Meddings and, and Christine Glanville and Barry Gray, and uh, and it was that's where I would buy my SIG magazine. Yes, back in what would it be eighty four ish. Yeah, yeah, that's about the right period for that. And there's and something that really drew me to the the one front cover. There was a color photo of Fireball XL five on the front, mm-hmm. and it was you know, <laughs> I still got them. I, I I still got them. I still treasure them. I, you know, I I collect all this stuff. Forget work. I I genuinely love this. And um, yeah, I, I, and again, back then that was the only way those kind of magazines and books and those articles in looking were the only ways you got to learn about how these shows were made. And it was total yep. treasure. But yeah, I, uh, in a way that made it almost um, more exciting because you've had to hunt this stuff down. You didn't just click on it accidentally on a YouTube, you know, you watch this so you might like this. It was, um, you know, you had to either... More purposeful. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you either had to hunt it down or order it or, or, it, or, or you were sh- you know, it was shared by a friend. But yeah, that place in, in Birmingham was um, was great. It's still there now under another name. But uh, no, it's, it's cool as hell. <laughs> Amazing. So, I mean, this stuff really pervades every part of your life. I mean, for listeners who can't see what I'm seeing, there's a gonzo over your shoulder, but there's also uh, a Big Chief Scott Tracy and a Captain Scarlet thing and some Super Mario Nation Blu-rays I can see there. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. I was just going to these earlier. The... Uh... Yeah, I've got the this is this is Super Mario Nation and the HD twenty one Blu ray, the the Thunderbirds Blu ray set, but it's the American set. Of course, so you can get the proper four three. So it's in four yeah. three. Nice, oh, nice. I, I've I've had conversations with um with with ITV uh, about the sixty nine. I imagine you have too. Yeah, uh, several. Uh, no no progress as yet, but I'm going to keep badgering them until they uh, get a restraining order or do it. <laughs> As, as, as a casual podcast listener, what we're referring to is the aspect ratio of Thunderbirds. On the English <laughs> Thunderbirds Blu-ray releases, they're all chopped and squizzed in 69. Whereas oh, the, the, they, they know. Yeah. They, they, they sign petitions and stuff. Uh, our, our lovely podsterons. Uh, oh, your podsterons are awesome. So we're, yeah, we're, I, we're all I, I will happily there, do, Well, because the, 
there were two re- there were two releases, weren't there? There, there was the J- the Japanese release in four three on Blu Ray, yeah, and the American release on Blu Ray. Our network going to do one? Well, I, I hope they will at some point, but at the minute, it's it's in the in the hands of ITV because that, yeah. that isn't part of network's deal yeah. currently. So, and then the the other ones that I, I was again bizarre how these things happen. I was. Um, a year or so back, I was in a coffee shop in Birmingham and there was a, a, a mate there who just waved me to come in and have a coffee and he was with someone else just having a meeting. And he says, oh, how are you doing? How's your day? He said, uh, it's, I said, it's the best day. I've just had this Blu-ray through of, of volume one of Captain Skull and the Mr. Ons on Blu-ray. I said, the restoration network have done is mm. unbelievable. It yeah. looks new. It's terrific. It does, isn't it? It's like yeah. it was shot yesterday. Yeah, and he and he said to me, "Oh, I said this is my mate," uh, and it was Tim from Network. Oh, <laughs> it was a guy that runs Network, basically. Yeah, yeah. And he, I mean, how the hell does that happen? Through sheer fluke, my mate was having a meeting with the guy from Network, and the first, I didn't know he was there or who he was, and I'm just you know getting all very excited about this. Amazing. How's the Joe Ninety restoration? How does that look? Well, it's all done. It's great. It was. It's award-winning. In fact, it, it won the uh, best best archive restoration project at some recent yeah, awards. Do yeah. Uh, but yeah, that looks stunning as well. Everything yeah. the network does looks stunning, pretty much. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, may, maybe Stingray in HD next. Oh Ooh, my god! Lovely. Can you imagine? Well, back at the studio here, I was just saying to Jamie before we started um, recording the podcast. The uh, I, I've got a, a, a secret cinema and um, there is a very nice big screen, 110 inch 4K Ufa Dufa vision and Captain Scarlet on that. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you know what? It's almost as good as the coin operated machines at Birmingham <laughs> Airport back in the early 80s. Almost. <laughs> almost as good. Just not quite. Yeah, I just keep on sticking in the 5P pieces. It's there. <laughs> And you can catch part two of Mark's interview next week. Well, Thanks, Mark. Yes, lovely. You see, it's it's interesting, isn't it? We, we've touched on this before when we, you spoke to John Colshaw just a, a few podcasts mm. back about the enduring quality of those voices, particularly from the early series, yes. were just as important as, as the visuals and, and the special effects. Really were, yep. weren't they? They absolutely were. I mean, you know, you, you say Thunderbird 2... Yeah. somebody and they can instantly picture the craft of their mind yeah you say scott tracy mm. you can probably picture the character but you can also instantly hear the voice yes that's right switching to horizontal flight that's, that's when i always hear that so clearly <laughs> yeah. in my mind's ear yeah uh but to, yeah that's that's absolutely part of the magic yeah um because you, you know you get lesser voices <clears throat> lesser voice actors doing that sort of thing yeah. and it, it just it's just not as convincing. You don't you don't get into it. As no, much. I suppose there's a so sweet really spot, isn't stuff. there, where where the visuals absolutely match the sound that you're hearing and the voice that you're hearing, and that's yeah. probably doesn't. It's not always the case, is it? I mean, sometimes you get close, but uh, just occasionally you you hit gold and you get someone like Shane doing doing Scott uh, Scott Tracy or uh, you know it might be any any number of them. It could be you know, David Graham or uh, Matt Zimmerman as well. Yeah, yeah. great stuff. Uh, this is an interesting question for you, Richard. Um, the uh, all the the dubbing and stuff on Space Precinct, mm. all the changing of character voices, yeah. yours, yours included. Yeah. Do you think that was a successful decision, and was it well executed? Well, I think that's rather a leading question. <laughs> it is, but I, yeah. I mean, well, no. I, I, I mean, I'm happy to say I think it was it was a, a, the wrong decision. Yeah. And I don't think it worked very well. I think it was crazy. I mean, I don't say that as as, as an actor who was dubbed because, as, as we've said before, actually, I quite like Orin's voice, and to me, the uh, the vocal performance from Kieran Jakinis did absolutely match the performance I was giving as the actor, and I think mm. that that was one of those uh, you know occasions where it worked nicely. But some of the episodes, for no apparent reason, you know, guest artists who would appear for an episode were, were dubbed. Uh, into strange sort of Scandinavian accents when, you know, mm. simply if they mentioned it on the day to the actor involved, could could you do, you know, a more exotic yeah. uh, accent? Of course they could have done. And very often you get this strange match of, of, of a character, the physical attributes of the character, not matching the voice that yeah. comes out of their mouth. It's just really odd. There's a strange disconnect. Idris Elba being a, you know, a famous case, of course. It just doesn't work. Yeah, it's it's a very difficult thing to get right. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, so, uh, every actor's contract has you know a clause about we reserve the right to double the voice. That's just the nature of the business, and that's understood. Uh, mm. But it, it was rather wholesale, and I think uh, to the detriment of the series, really. Yeah, mm. great shame, isn't it? Yeah, it is. 
Anyway, Richard. Yeah. We've uh, neatly talked about space precincts. Today, yes. You see. That's you see right. Why I did that? Very clever. Yeah. Winky wink wink. Yeah. It's because mm. coming up imminently on the sequencer. On the sequencer, <laughs> which is the sequel to the randomizer, when we've got a two-parter. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's not. Quisdale watching the second yeah. part of uh, of Death Watch. Um, and anything you want to share with us about the second part of Death Watch before we get into it? Ah, uh, well, all I'll say about the second part of Death Watch is that my final scene with Captain Podley and I think Romek in the station house, where we uh, raise a glass to each other, uh, was actually the final scene that I shot in the series. So, Aww. yeah, it's quite a sweet moment. So bear that in mind if you're uh, watching along at home. Lovely. Well, let's get straight into the randomizer. Last time on the randomizer. Projected impact areas, eastern edge of the bay and the ocean beyond. So track and chart every damn fragment. Fantastic. Mr. Butler! Are you sure you're OK? Captain Weldon, M.R.A. What does military intelligence want with these two? Damn cops. They're everywhere. What if he gets in the way? We've just got to let things take their course. Is there something under the building? Something he wanted? That's classified. It's all classified. We have to stop it. Well, if it's that bad, then people have the right to know what it is. You don't know, do you? You don't either. And now the conclusion. And not just any conclusion, this is Death Watch Conclusion. That is literally the title of the episode, because I guess Death Watch, here's some more stuff for you, or or Death Watch, we weren't going to do a part two, and now we are. Weren't as good titles. don't know what it is. But this is our series finale for Space Precinct, and uh, as such, it's going to be quite interesting to see how we wrap up not only the events of last week's episode, but also the entire series. Uh, and again, it's still there. baffling First to me that yes, originally there was no plans for a follow-up for for Death Watch. It's just crazy. Anyway, that was last week. This is this week. We do have a conclusion for Death Watch, thankfully, because I think if if part one had always remained a standalone episode, it would have been just such a... It, it would have almost been like a... A, a pointless sort of cul-de-sac of an episode where it's like, hey, some stuff happened. Why did it happen? We don't really know or care. Anyway. The meteor... I, I can never remember if it's the meteor is the big one, the meteorite is the little one. I'm going to stick with that. Right now. Command has to know what makes it tick first. The meteor has been, as we saw last week, it's in the sealed container. Graffer and Weldon have that in a warehouse. They also have the uh, little um, meteorite that landed at Butler's farm. And Weldon's put the meteorite down near the meteor. It seemed to quite like that. Since Butler is now dead, it's vibrating. Major Graffer has taken it upon himself to be the one who wants to do its thing, get as close as possible to the dangerous alien space thing. If this is it. Ground Zero is the best seat in the house. Oh, you idiot. You may as well have just said, nothing can possibly go wrong. That would have been right? um, the only way you could have guaranteed Take it easy. getting screwed even more than you already have been. Anyway, Weldon is now helping Raffer up. Taking a moment. Turn around. Oh, we have a purple eye now. Graff has gone over to the side of the meteor. And something... What are you doing? It needs this! You may notice, um, watching these two episodes back-to-back, -back, or even as the uh, compilation that's available on, on most of the uh, DVD sets, Graffa looks slightly different in this episode, and that is because uh, it's a different actor wearing the head this week. I think last week it was Andy Dawson, and this week... Stop her! Uh, I, I, I want to say it's Rob Thurtle, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so I'm not sure if it's the same head that's being worn. Um, I would imagine it probably isn't. And I'm not sure why they, they switched actors for this character, to be honest. Unless, I can think of two reasons. One, Graffer is far more of a physical presence in this one than he was in the last one. Last week, he, will. he barely moved. This week, we're... We're, what, five minutes into this episode? He's already had one fight scene, and now he's collapsed in front of the meteor. 
waving his fist, saying, I'm going to get the meteorite back from Weldon. But also, later in the episode, as he starts to physically deteriorate, I imagine there was probably a few more animatronic heads built for him, so yeah, maybe it made sense to to get another actor. It's your anniversary today. Yeah, I know. You're not going to do the same thing as last year, are you, Dad? So it's Brogan and Sally's anniversary. That's nice. I'm sure nothing will happen to distract him. Stay calm. Yeah, or maybe it will. Let's take a ride. And Brogan, I mean, surely by now Brogan would have like 28 locks on his hopper. The number of times it gets broken into or blown up entirely, he would be... But no, he just seems to, Over to the casually leave it unlocked for any crazed stranger to... Door, let themselves into. And I do like the path they take well then down through this um, your story. Uh, second half. This is Nadia, a planet on the far side of the river. And suddenly galaxy. she's very willing to Just talk about things she wasn't prepared to talk about last week. Now these pictures are taken live from the planet's last operational satellite. It's almost as if last week she didn't actually know what was going on. And this week, now that we have a story... Dead areas are eruptions from a space-born parasite. Yeah. At first, everyone thought they were meteorites. story of this um, previous planet that's been uh, just devastated by the arrival of uh, a similar meteorite. Uh-uh. We don't know what that is. Randall Butler had it. He it must be strange for an actor to... Um, have to play a character who knows what's going on, but you yourself as the actor don't actually know what it is that they know and then suddenly this other script comes along and suddenly you know everything and you always did and it's it must be a very odd thing to play you know so much already i'm alone lieutenant yeah you know about the guy who fell down the stairs and the the old woman in the apartment block t z a Oh, she's injected Brogan with some of this. It's uh, a lethal enzyme. Lethal it enzyme. Runs in every strand of DNA in your body. I don't know how much time has passed in universe between Death Watch One and Death Watch Conclusion. I kind of like watching the series in production order. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the end of the series production order goes Death Watch. Fire Within 1, Fire Within 2, Forever Beetle, and Death Watch Conclusion. So there are three episodes made between Part 1 and Part 2 of this story. And I, I choose to believe that that's how it unfolded in the Space Precinct universe. I imagine it would have taken time to clear away the, the rubble from the tower and dig out the meteor and get it transferred to somewhere else in the city. I mean, maybe... Maybe it wouldn't have taken the length of three episodes. But, you know, maybe it wouldn't have happened instantly. Maybe it, it's... There's a bit of time has gone between these two. Do you want to go out this weekend? For fun? No. For real. And that is the beginning of... Um, this is a scramble where the Haldane Castle relationship is ultimately going to end up. And it was kind of hinted at in the first episode, the first part, um, when the Haldane was worrying about um, all those the weird flowers and chocolates from her presumably slightly want? strange brother who you know, there's there. lo that lovely scene where he's talking to Bertha and he's worried that he's going to lose her um, and again those two those two moments were never meant to connect but they do they do quite well I think yeah captain I got a problem here she dosed me what? what'd you hit him with? TZ8 any personal lens on Oh no. Oh, that's something else that Carson knows absolutely everything about. And that was our deal. I don't quite know how far Weldon expected to get on the station house, considering she'd already previously visited and everybody knew her. Um, it might just have been better if she'd waited in the hopper, to be honest. The MAA's chief of staff is on his way up to handle it. I'm meeting him in the briefing room. How'd they know Suddenly well, I'm a good guy again this well, week. I, I don't know what was happening last week. I do apologize, gentlemen. Dug up could take out the whole planet. That's her story, Haldane. It could be a fabrication. Although, yeah, there is a little bit of um, poddly siding with the military in this one, which again is, um, you know, it, it makes him look a bit doofy, but also it is part of his job. At least this week there is a, a justification for why he's not so keen to help 
um, Brogan like and Haldane. Weird. Give a yell. Okay. So now Took and Carson are doing a very dangerous-ish thing of opening the meteor that uh, infected Butler. Um, Carson is wearing what I think is a a redress of a previous costume. It's tried try to infect him, but didn't. Meanwhile, Took is completely unprotected except for a sort of gauze it's barrier type thing that she's scanning the, the, the spore Walton through. The oh, I gave away the plot. It's a spore. I'll take custody of Weldon and the meteorite. I'll have them brought up. Um, uh, let me do it. I feel bad for him. Oh, that's quite sweet. Yeah, here on Precinct 88 Station House. More we, coffee, Major? We, yeah, more coffee. And we feel bad for Brilliant. people and... We're the, we're the caring police station. The one that Weldon's after is probably the female, the seed. And you sure as hell don't want this one near it. I know all this by taking the top off the canister, grimacing, and then putting it back on. A lot of pollens hitch rise on other life forms, in this case us. What would they do without Carson? He just knows everything. And I think that's the last we see of Carson. And partly, it's taking too long. Once again, dispensing all sorts of knowledge that he really probably shouldn't have, but he does because he's Carson and he just knows everything. At this point, everybody accepts that. Let's go. Where? I'm getting you out of here. Weldon's being busted out of the cells now. But where is our, my favorite space precinct character? There he is, the Creon cell guard with no apparent name. Don't worry about it. She's my responsibility. Will he get knocked out this week? You can't take her away. Yes, he will. And kicked in the stomach. You lay a hand on another officer and I'm going to drop He's never named in the series. Uh, you can sort of vaguely make out his name if you zoom in. But I just love that every time that guy appeared, he's being beaten up or locked in his own cell or just humiliated generally. There he is. She's gone. Code 11, Officer Down, Prisoner Large. Repeat. Yeah, I choose to believe that Code 11 is... Um, code 11, Officer Down. Code 11 means that specific officer is down because it happens so often. Um, yeah, there's a there's a different code for other officers down. You know, competent people. That guy gets his own code because he's so useless. <laughs> oh, so um, yeah, that didn't work for Graffa. He um, he just missed beating uh, Brogan and Weldon to the hangar bay. Brogan just shut the door um, and Bra Graffa couldn't, couldn't unlock it. I don't know why, but he just resorted to someone pounding impotently on the window. Broach these fugitives with caution. Welcome to the club. Brogan and Weldon, both on the run with the meteorite. Sal, I can't come home for a while and uh, you're going to hear some things about me. Brogan, what's happening? I can't say over the comm. And, and scenes like this are... I want to celebrate It's a really you, nice you dynamic it. that Ted Shackelford and Nancy it. Paul had are when she right? wasn't being a, a just I love you. nagging... I love you. ...fishwife. Um, she... You, they're very believable as husband and wife, and I wish... What's your best guess? I wish the writing of the of Sally in particular was was stronger because in episodes like this think like he thinks where it's really good in this episode I don't have a problem with her at all it's just unfortunate that most of the time she does appear I do anyway Brogan and Weldon have now been found get on their tail by Graffer in his um very small military um fighter thingy there's three officers cramped into this tiny little flyer it's still powerful enough to do some damage to their uh, stolen fast. All vehicles, I'm calling a 24-hour alert. Lieutenant Brogan is still at large. Uh, why aren't you calling a 26-hour alert? Uh, uh, the the missing two hours nap time. Because we, it's been well established in this series up until now that Altor operates on a 26-hour day cycle. I yeah, that's very odd to have gone out of their way through the previous 23 episodes to mention. 26 hour day, 26 hour day, 26 hour day, and slip up in the final episode. It's, it's easily done, but it's just odd that they would fall at the final hurdle on that, that tiny little point that they themselves made. I mean, Podley told me about the MIA. He also told me that, that you, you might not be yourself. There's nothing wrong with me. Ah, uh, so I see. Stop Look, it. Well, this is perfect, perfectly normal You're behavior for the uh, and Mr. and Mrs. Brogan constantly yelling at each other. And this is good. What's this? Just hang on a minute, will ya? 
They asked for you. They're your friends. Yeah, we ain't here to arrest you or nothing. Nah, just to find out what's going on. I love that those three have such faith in Brogan that they're... They just want to sit down and have a chat and find out what's, what's going on. Usual. You and Sal, you spend every anniversary cuddled up, making out, watching a movie, because that's what you did on your first anniversary, because, because it's all we could afford. And what I also love about this is, so, you know, it, it could very easily have you know, just I been Haldane who shows up here. The fact that it's Haldane and Orin and Romek, it gives those those other two characters something to be part of. Um, so reporting. Nothing doing in the Sura. In an episode that could very easily have just forgotten them, they could have been doing some you know, minor comedy antics somewhere else that had no direct bearing on the plot. The fact that they are involved in this final episode in such a such a crucial way is, is I think, a brilliant touch. And again, it presents them as, as competent officers that the the show wasn't always uh, keen to do. Ah, forget her. I have what I need. Yep, Weldon has... No, Graffa has got the um, the spore thingy stolen from the back of Weldon's van and is taking it out to the former butler's farm. Uh, did I just give away a twist ending? I think I might have done. Yes, um, he has built a military bunker on the site of Butler's farm. And in this bunker we have the You're meteor. Dismissed. Get your things and leave immediately. Yes, sir, but get out of here! Also a slightly odd moment that um, Graffa has turned up with the meteorite, dismissed the two technicians on duty, one of whom is Andy Dawson, who played Graffa in part one. So yeah, this is um, Graffa. It must have been odd for him to to be watching a character that he originated now being played by someone else. And then we also have... Look at that. <laughs> and he has now been shot by uh, by his former character. It's all very strange. But there's some beautiful lighting going on in this um, this bunker scene here. The the purple glow from the meteor and the meteorite and uh, Graffa's possessed eye. Uh, it's all it all looks very sinister, and he he looks even more so with that that eye patch on. Now. Gonna press the meteor onto the meteorite. Uh oh. The, the um, major graph of animatronic seems a bit more expressive this week too. There's he's watching the um, uh, meteor sort of hatch and spores are appearing all around the the bunker walls and there are roots digging into the floor it all looks very scary and sinister and he's he is properly sort of like he's in shock and now it's just like oh god what have i done far more expressive than last week i think it must be a different head officers haldane rummick and orin are failing to report would you have any ideas or information on that castle they've likely gone to hook up with brogan sir Add their names to the dragnet. Captain, they wouldn't turn on us. It's they odd that um, Castle and Tucker well, are excluded from. In any event, we need to from know, the teaming we? up with Brogan thing. I know someone has to be sent out to bring them in, and it kind of makes sense to pit Get Castle sorry. against Haldane. It just seems slightly, um, slightly odd, given how, given the strength of their relationships, that the boys would just disappear without saying anything to the girls. I'd sure like to know what he's been doing. Because <laughs> hey. it's not like, you know, What's that? Castle and Took can't handle themselves in a scrap. Oh. They can do just as well as Orin and Romek, I dare say, possibly even better. Farmers in the Tri Valley are concerned about. A and I remember in, um, in the fine Tri publication of um, Space Precinct Unmasked, the book by uh, some some fellow who was, was attached to the series. He played Orin, and he, he says he doesn't actually remember filming this scene at all. It starts with um, Orin um, bathing his, his face in water um, at the start of the day. He doesn't remember filming this. We know how to find the thing now. Does he remember any part of this episode? Richard James, do you remember any part of this episode? Were you there? Stay low until you get to the oh dear, and then, uh, big starring orin moment of heat. splashing water on your face. Another kind of heat I'm worried about. The dead plant life will be starting to rot. 
emitting heat. And they seem to have slightly it's an exact picture of the affected area. revamped um, the military van interior for this episode. They've got rid of all the calculators. It's rather, rather a shame. Unless it's a different vehicle. Anyway, meanwhile inside... Ah, oh, Graffer is, um, yeah, covered in sores and blisters. Uh, also, some tears on his uniform, which I'm, I'm not sure how that happened. Scramble a cruiser! Because he... I don't know, unless he's... His body's giving off like, intense heat or something as he rots and he's burning holes in his uniform. It doesn't really make sense otherwise. We're directly above the epicenter. Right. Check the land register, see who owns it. Yeah, it's coming up now. Oh, and that um, shot of the uh, land, registry, uh, land registry list going by, um, it was too quick to spot anything. But I know that if you pause it and watch it frame by frame, there are some interesting uh, little joke names in there that they, they sometimes like to do in this show. I think there was a mention of Trumpton. I could be wrong. You want him? You got him. This sequence has never sat right with me either. Brogan and Haldane have just shot down the military cruiser. It's, it's a gorgeous looking shot of the cruiser falling out of the sky with the sun behind it and crashing and exploding. But, um... Like I said, next time I shoot back. It just feels more like material for an advert break cliffhanger because on board that military jet were military officers just doing their job. And I know they were out to shoot Brogan and Haldane down at any cost, but at the same time, they weren't Honestly, baddies on that cruiser, and we arrest them. Um, Brogan and Haldane treated them as if they were right. A, a yeah, slightly, slightly dodgy character moment there from Brogan. I guess it was kill or be killed, but even so, that bit has never sat right with me. Scanning for movement. With my repainted label maker. Anyway, we're now in, uh, I think this is the Pinewood back lot, where they've built the, uh, two at 10, two at 30. built Site R. And it's, it's so nice to get out on location in this show, which they rarely did. It looks like it was a nice day as well, which we're all set here. must have been a relief. They made it! I thought you'd never ask. So the um, precinct, precinct 88 team and Weldon are uh, storming site R, and at least they've got their oh, so they've got their weapons on stun. So Brogan shot the um, female guard, but as she went to grab her weapon, she started to recover, and Haldane just kicked her in the face. Yay, our heroes! What the Captain Pudley, Commander? I'm you going to do something like good for remember? once. I, I've had a, I've had a couple of off episodes, but now I'm going to come back and I'm going to I'm going to be the good guy I, I always am. What's on your mind? Major Graffer's on my mind. My very best people have broken ranks to help Weldon. Help Weldon. Now doesn't that bother you? And this um, military general commander. Thank you for your concern. Um, whatever he is. This is another actor from Space Precinct who actually previously yes, appeared in UFO. Scramble the scorpion uh, this is Bernal Tucker, Time who was in... We have to kill them all. Uh, he was in Ordeal. He was a shadow... Um, just a shadow operative who was visiting the health spa in Ordeal. And he was also the pilot of the... Um, I think it was the Albatross, the seaplane, the shadow seaplane in, in Subsmash. And it's, I like that they there are enough old faces from UFO and Space 1999 that, that turned up in Space Precinct. I like to think that the casting director would have seen an, an old Jerry Anderson show on their CV and thought, OK, that's it, you're in. You see, it's like a fungus, Brogan. A very simple life form. Yeah. Well, maybe we can take it apart. Cell by cell. Post-germination of the seed, Graffa has become almost this sort of um, drunk zombie. He's like, he, he's resigned to the fact that he is dying. And he's kind of like, you know, this is, oh, it's brilliant. The seed is wonderful. 
Oh, it's terrible as well. It's kind of a sort of mix, mixed motivation, but it's nice that he before you get close enough. He comes through. No, let me be your shield. And does the right thing. I'm dead already. It's finished with me. But I'm still a soldier. Come on, Lieutenant. Here's your last shot. That is a perfect, uh, perfect tagline for the final episode. Space Precinct. And as a series finale, um, and I think this is the second series finale we've covered now. Well, no, actually, third after both of New Captain Scarlet's. I think this is probably. Probably tied with Grey Skulls for my favourite Anderson series finale because, again, it actually it ends. It doesn't tie up everything, but we have this great story building to a, a really strong conclusion with the attack on the bunker, the threat of this this seed, which has just been injected with the uh, same uh, killer enzyme that Brogan was earlier, and it's let's go, move it, come on. It, it feels like a final episode that also is sort of it, it's resolving long-running threads, like this scene with Haldane and Castle. This is so sweet. Hold on, Castle. Drop your weapon, Haldane. Would it help if I told you I love you? I don't know. What about you? I love you too, but... So what do you say you two guys don't shoot each other, huh? Yeah, take a lifetime to hassle it out. Look, cut it out, guys. What is That's going on? It's Orin and always there to... to punctuate any tender moments with... Uh, their own viewpoint but it is again that's a, a nice a nice culmination of everything that's been running through the series i like that they finally learn and i don't know what, who i'm referring to when i say they they finally learnt the lessons from all of the itc era shows that very often they didn't go to a second series and there's always that dissatisfaction that there was never an ending as such and obviously you don't want to Think so. To give the series a final end if there's even a glimmer of a chance of a second series. So it's better to do what what this episode does. End on a really strong story that ties up a lot of the ongoing threads. There's a scorpion! It's on a target run! We're dead. I'm not entirely sure that this um final final bit of drama in this uh, sudden attack by a, a bomber is um, is all that necessary to be honest because it's like we've defeated the um, Go! apocalyptic world ending threat in theory that should be enough to to sort of that should be enough but I suppose we need to end with an explosion and now that the seed has been destroyed lock and load Jane don't miss her, all our dates are cancelled. We've got to go out with a, an even bigger bang. Which is fine. Launch missile. Affirmative. Fire in the hole. I mean, these guys are not quite the same level of threat as... Again, literally the end of the world, but I, I guess if it gives us another big explosion... Come on, move it! Kill radius is one mile, we won't make it! Go! And I also love what this potentially could have been. And I know it never would have been. But how, Brogan and... Um, not Brogan and Haldane. Haldane and Castle, having finally expressed their love for each other, then immediately get killed. That could have been a, a, a real gut-punch ending. We're okay. Of course, Space Precinct isn't going to do that. It was close. And as for Brogan and Haldane loving each other, of course they did, of course. So now it's time to say goodbye hey, Orin, you about ready? to all yeah, our yeah. favourite characters. <sighs> all I want is a Except, oddly enough, scene. Took, who doesn't get any send-off at all. I mean, Carson and Slow-Mo don't get any send-off either, but... I found this at the bottom of my drop. There's no reason why Took couldn't be yeah, here. Captain? With probably Fredo, uh, Orin and Romek as they, uh... Sergeant Fredo! Captain. They have an end-of-series drink. Whatever this is so take, sweet. Slancha. Uh, sure. Here's mud in your eye. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's such a nice, nice way to end it. You're a very good cook. I never would and have dreamed. we finally have. <laughs> I have to admit, past is the only thing. Haldane and Castle. <laughs> making out on the sofa. What time is it? Which, um, oh, yeah, I, 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 to be honest, I couldn't really see their relationship ending We're any other way. Um, tomorrow. That's a much shorter ride to the station from my place. And if there had been a second series, which I think there really should have been, I think the series had really found itself by this point, it would have been nice to see their relationship progress and um, develop. I think maybe... Um, potentially, if they potentially put them into a situation where their relationship kind of compromised their performance as police officers, explore that dynamic of, of two married police officers and the you know the strain that puts them under. Must have been doing something right. As long as it doesn't um, develop into another Brogan and Sally, yeah, constant bickering situation. Mm -hmm. Not as long as there's a good cop around. <laughs> so that was the end of Death Watch conclusion. That's the end of Space Precinct. Well, I mean, obviously not on the randomizer because we still have plenty of other episodes to uh, to look at. But that was the, the the series finale. And yeah, as a series finale, I think that works really well. It's a nice. It, it was. I suppose it was handy for them to to make a a second part of an episode that they'd already made because they didn't have to spend as much time setting up the story um, but lots of lots of lovely uh, character moments particularly towards the end as various things were, were tied up some nice action and um, yeah the, the, the potentially end of the world apocalyptic threat did genuinely feel like a a, a, a strong enough a strong enough material for a series finale I think so yeah still one of my favourite Jerry Anderson series finales I think that's um, I think everything went right there ah uh, Death Watch part 2 it's a good one yeah. uh, weird that there might not have been a part 2 but, I know uh, I, yeah, thank, uh, thank goodness there's, there was there was talk I think of doing a recap you know a, a, a clip episode uh, sort of you know a kind of you know when, they, when there's flashbacks to previous episodes to, to save a bit of money, I guess towards the end of the series they were r running out of cash. There was serious talk about you know maybe putting one of the characters in some sort of situation where they have to flash back to the previous twenty three episodes. Can't mm. imagine that happening now. It wouldn't have worked at all, would it? But uh, Death Watch, the second part's quite nice. We got outside, I remember. We did lots of um, filming outside in the lot, which I'm sure Chris would have mentioned there, uh, yeah. which was quite fun uh, on a summer's day. We had, I think, uh, a visit to the set from uh, some uh, uh, competition winners. Uh, right. And I remember one of them in particular quoting uh, a line of Ted Shackelford's dialogue from a previous episode and the look of amusement on his face because he'd never met fans quite like a Jerry Anderson fan before. Ah. <laughs> ah. Um, and what else? And Ralph Titterton, I remember there as well. They're taking lots of uh, set pictures, uh, which I know he's um, still got archived away somewhere. So although yeah. we were coming to the end, of the series there it's still a really busy time it didn't feel like we were winding down at all yeah, yeah. interesting it's funny how much they use the back loss actually yes uh, for the exterior stuff because I, I certainly remember um, kind of exterior kind of fire escapes yeah, that's right back of LM stage being used for quite yeah. a lot of things yeah. and quite often running through um, stacks of shipping containers and that's various it. other things yeah a few things. night shoots I think we did out there as you well you did that with Commander didn't that's you? right yeah <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah. On, on, on remnants of the old Batman set I think uh, if, that's, if that's memory serves, yeah. Yeah, it could well be. Yeah. Funny, isn't it? But it's always, it was like having a day off school, you know, going going to shoot outside. It's, it's quite, you know, something special. Lifted yeah. the day a bit. Oh. Yeah. Happy memories. Happy memories indeed, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, next week, it'll be back to the randomizer. Yep, it will. And back to a random selection, and we won't know what it is no. before it plays out. That's right. Uh, so, um, yeah, hope you enjoyed that one. Yes, great. Do email us to let us know your thoughts. And if it's got you watching Space Precinct for the first time, then even better. Yeah. Let us know. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. That's right. Yes, don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to us on and rate and review and share. Uh, hashtag us on Twitter, Jerry Anderson Podcast, and get in touch with I'm Jamie Anderson or me, Richard N. James. And uh, we'll see you there. <laughs> we will. On Twitter. Quite possibly. Yeah. Yes, most probably. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Till uh, next time. See you then. Bye. Bye. Stage 
one complete. Let's go. Do you think so? I think that's right up there, that one, yeah. <laughs> I think it is. I think you've got, no, you've got, you've got a lot, fantastic randomizer there. We've got an interview with a voice artist. Yep. I enjoyed Fab <laughs> Facts. I actually did enjoy Fab Facts this week. Did you? Yeah, that was rather nice. That's unusual. Yeah. yeah. Having said that, I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> no, funny. What did we talk about half about, an hour ago? About brains. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did enjoy it. Basically. Losing us. Yeah. I enjoyed it so much I forgot about it. That's right, yeah. No, it's a classic, classic. Number 57, was it, did you say? Number 57, Richard, which is what you said in the intro last week and I had to edit it out. (laughs) I'm sorry, yeah. We're we're really switched on, aren't we? Yeah, we really are. It's about time you've got a a new co-presenter, I think. What's Mark (laughs) Silt doing these days? He must have time on his hands. Can't he do it? I'll send him an email straight away. (laughs) I bet he does a passable Richard James impression. (laughs) (laughs) I'll do my best to get one from him. Right, I think we need a rest. Bye! Goodbye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun?